It's my honor today to have been asked by Presbytera Catherine Baker to contribute uh, a piece for uh, the book launch of Father Matthew Baker's new book, um, Faith Seeking Understanding, um, which is a great joy to see released from St. Vladimir Seminary Press. Uh, I've been looking forward to this book for many years. Uh, and I wrote this piece uh, based largely on uh, uh, messages, text messages, uh, and the like between me and Father Matthew over a period of a few years uh, in honor of the release of this book. So I'm just going to read it straight through for you today. Matthew Baker, academic, pastor, friend. Treasures from my archive of our text messages by Hiram Monk Herman Mazak. It's Wednesday night in the first week of Lent. I'm unwinding after a day full of church, and judging by his text message, so is Father Matthew. So I'm kind of reeling from pre-sanctified tonight, which was so beautiful. I just love it. My phone lights up again. Last year, I found the rubrics mind-boggling, but this time it seemed really easy. That year was 2015, Father Matthew's second Lent as a priest, and what was to be his first and only Lent as a parish pastor. My phone lit up again. I preached a longer, much adapted, more spelled out, and less dense version of the sermon I just published on OCN. By the way, this part-time priest thing is really not part-time. I'm not unhappy about that at all. At the same time, I do need to be careful to, cur to carve out guarded time to write my dissertation, which is what I'm doing right now and tomorrow all day. For his friends and colleagues, messages and emails from Father Matthew came in thick, plentiful clusters. He and I kept up a continuous online conversation from the summer of 2013 until his death in 2015, after which I downloaded and archived the whole thing, nearly 500 pages. I had been teaching at St. Vladimir Seminary when he and his family had an apartment on campus while he completed his PhD coursework at nearby Fordham University. A decade previous, we were students together at St. Tikhon Seminary. But at St. Vladimir's, I was privileged to witness Matthew's growth as a friend and mentor to many. About a year after he moved away from St. Vlad's, he told me how much he missed being there on campus. I really loved the students, he wrote. Matthew was the preeminent scholar of Father George Florovsky, the guardian of his papers and the interpreter of his thought. But it's no exaggeration to say that his relationship with academia was, much like Florovsky's, unconventional. He never completed high school or college, yet he spent many years as a student or resident at four Orthodox seminaries while progressing towards his PhD at Fordham. At times he could be sharply critical of the culture of academia, its fashionable intellectual fetishes, and its impersonal officialdom. But to the students themselves, his heart was wide open. Especially warm was his love for the undergraduates, whom he taught at Helena College in spring 2014. As much as these friendships were characterized by intellectual rigor and bookishness, there was also no lack of goofy banter mixed with affection and, sol and solicitude. To have Father Matthew as a teacher was to have a brother, a father, and a friend. Real spiritual fathers and teachers, he wrote to me once, love their children in a way that is palpable so that their students or children want to obey and follow. But he was also aware of possible pitfalls. People who demand respect and obedience, he said, have problems. Thus, a teacher must watch out for self-love. Narcissism is a helpful category against which to examine oneself, he wrote, including in teaching. Namely, am I loving or mentoring a student just as a projection of myself? I can see how I've been guilty of this. 
As a mentor, Father Matthew was lavishly generous. He gave freely because he himself had freely received. The care and kindness throughout his life of several fatherly mentors were foundational for him. I depend greatly on mentors, he said, in a certain way, not for the details, there I am extremely independent, but in terms of general direction and emotionally in terms of support. He sought out and thrived on such encouragement throughout his career, and especially when he set his hand to writing his doctoral dissertation. Despite his capacious and lively mind, he found academic writing to be onerous and draining work. Absent the company of his trusted mentors and colleagues, the task could seem to verge on meaninglessness. I'm basically not in regular contact with anyone for whom this sort of thing matters, he wrote, so it's hard to believe it does matter. At SVS, people were always busy with writing, and I would see people in my department engaged in the same, but now I see no one. It's not to say it doesn't matter to me, it does. It just frankly doesn't matter to many around me, and we are all social creatures. The previous day he had written, I've been loving serving as a priest, and loving my kids and wife, not much else. Dissertation does not seem so important now. At other times, though, it would be plain how much he loved his dissertation work and saw its significance. One evening I asked him to remind me what he was writing about. A rapid stream of messages came back. Orthodox engagement with modern historicism and continental philosophical hermeneutics. In particular, Florovsky's engagement with such figures as Dilvey, Royce, and Collingwood, and the reference and the, and the relevance of this to understanding his conception of neopatristic synthesis. But I also have a chapter on Zizioulas and Heidegger, and my concluding chapter touches on more recent discussions, Bear, etc. The question of realism and idealism is threaded through here, too. Why do you ask? Because Burnett was trying to remember, I said. Right, he continued. So, questions like temporal distance and interpretation, truth as historical event, eschatology and interpretation, the nature of doctrinal formulae. So, what is this dissertation not about? He ignored my sarcasm and plowed ahead. Relating the past to the present. Basically, all problems raised by the attempt to relate tradition and a stable conception of truth to modern historical consciousness. Implied in that, too, would be a stable conception of human nature, though that's not a focus here. There you have it. He had set himself a tall order. At times he found it impossibly tall, especially given so many other demands on his attention. But there was one goal that often proved an effective motivator. He wrote, I feel like once I have that stupid degree in hand, I can do great things. That statement, however, contains an unintended irony, since for years he had already been doing great things. That this is so, all the content of this present volume bear testimony. And as for his future dreams, they were not narrowly academic. If I had my own parish, he once mused, I might dispense with Friday night salutation services during Lent, and instead have liturgy every Saturday morning, and just have a continual series of sermons on Hebrews. Nice idea, I responded. Yeah, he said. Why doesn't anyone do it? The only sermons I have ever heard on Hebrews during Lent are my own. What went into the makeup of a good parish? For Father Matthew, solid teaching was key, but was only one ingredient. When orthodoxy in America is at its strongest, he wrote, I think it's characterized by a focus on the gospel and evangelism, a fairly well-educated clergy and laity, communities centered on the Eucharist, and a model of church life which is much more congregationally focused than in most orthodox countries, affording people a strong sense of community that they do not find in the surrounding American culture. 
Father Matthew saw warm networks of Christian community as the necessary context for vibrant preaching and teaching. Robust learning at every level, from family Bible reading at home, to regular Sunday and weekday preaching, to seminary training and advanced theological research and dialogue. None of this could thrive outside the context of families and communities fundamentally oriented towards the apostolic faith, to the glory of God the Father. Parish, seminary, academy. These worlds were interlaced in Father Matthew's life, and sometimes they vied for his attention. I love the pastoral work, he wrote, really love it, but I do feel my vocation includes academic teaching as well, and that's the only reason I'm doing this degree. Otherwise, forget it. Later, with more nuance, he remarked, I love these students. The academic thing I love less, in terms of the scene, I mean, not research, which I do love. The research, though, was not its own end, but was ordered towards the broadening of theological culture throughout the church, and in particular among the clergy. We do need to revive the model of the educated clergyman, he wrote. It's a different model of education than the academic specialist. It's intentionally generalist, breadth of learning and culture, not research-oriented, instead enjoyment-oriented and edification-oriented. Russians have this. It's their love of art, novels, etc. It's not something you get by adding a seminary class on theology in the novel, either. It's a culture. Orthodox academia, particularly in North America, was missing the mark, both theologically and culturally. He wrote, I agree with our liberal academics that the anti-Western thing is not good. I just wish they would learn something about the best in Western Christianity, rather than Western secularism. Elsewhere, he was more succinct. Our Orthodox know about the Fathers and Derrida, but they don't care about the Christian humanists of the West in the last couple centuries. And this despite the fact that we are Westerners, Anglophone, it is our tradition, and this tradition is a tributary of the Greek tradition. That which he found wanting among Orthodox academics, he would take delight in discovering among non-Orthodox. Once he mentioned a Baylor professor, Ralph Wood, he is a Baptist with very Orthodox sympathies, writes on literature, loves Solzhenitsyn, Schmemann, Dostoevsky, etc., Flannery O'Connor. If I were at the seminary, I'd be pushing for this sort of broad Christian humanism. But the cultural narrowness he perceived among many Orthodox was a symptom of a larger problem, a theological problem, a crisis of Orthodox identity that is, in his words, deeper than leftist academics or zealot anti-ecumenist monks peddling their stuff. I have a feeling, he wrote, that no one really cares about theology anymore, not in the real sense. We live in an age of massive biblical and creedal illiteracy, and our academics are doing little to help that. N.T. Wright is a great exception. I do not see anyone quite as good on the orthodox side, not in America anyway. The Orthodox strike me as afflicted with a corporate obsession about their own identity, both the liberals and the traditionalist types. We focus on being Greek, Russian, Eastern, the exoticism and supposed uniqueness of everything Orthodox from all other Christians, etc. Not good. Our academics are focused on showing other academics that they are not typical convert zealots, and that Vladimir Putin and Hilary and Alfeyev do not represent all of orthodoxy. That's what I see. It's depressing. Yes, I agreed. It is depressing. N.T. Wright is a good Christian, Matthew added, despite his support of women's ordination. In these last few quotations, we can discern two interwoven themes that are, that are prominent throughout this book. One theme is the struggle to maintain the faith once for all delivered to the saints, Jude, verse 3. 
that is, the Orthodox tradition in all it gives to us and all it demands from us. On this, Father Matthew would quote Florovsky's warning against the dangerous path of doctrinal minimalism. But the other theme is the need for charitable engagement with the work, culture, and indeed institutions of non-Orthodox Christianity. While some may find these two themes to be at cross purposes, for Father Matthew, as for Father George, they were integrally connected. The notion of Christian East and West, he wrote, as two monolithic opposed civilizations is, as Florovsky said, a dangerous fiction. Father Matthew saw orthodoxy confronting many of the same dogmatic and moral errors that for decades have been plaguing and decimating Western Christian communions. He included among these, er uh, among these errors philosophical matters of first principles. He discussed this less than a month before his death. There is a basic confusion or conflation, he wrote, of the Holy Ghost with the Zeitgeist. Behind that basic confusion is a metaphysic of eminentism or pantheism. As I said to Professor N, my ways are not your ways, nor are my thoughts your thoughts, saith the Lord. And that I work from the starting point assumption that I am not God and I don't know God. I need to rely on his word to know him. This is where I get on better with my Barthian Protestant friends rather than Orthodox or Roman Catholic liberals. In many ways, then, faithful Orthodox and faithful non-Orthodox find themselves sharing a common fight and a common enemy. Solovyov was right about one thing, Father Matthew asserted. Secularism and persecution and catastrophe are going to separate the sincere, even if heterodox, Christians from those who cloak other agendas in vaguely Christian dress. And yet, as open as Father Matthew was to that which is good and beautiful in non-Orthodox Christianity, he did not trivialize the real and fundamental differences. Reading discussions online between Roman Catholic and Orthodox, I do feel we are very far apart. Regarding primacy, divorce, I asked. No, he said, more fundamental things, like how we conceive of truth. I think that, functionally speaking, for them, the prime medium of truth is propositions, the certitude of which is guaranteed by the mechanism of the Church's magisterium. This is not a teaching, it's deeper than that. It's a founding presupposition. So here's what I think. I think that propositions aren't so primary for us. I think that for us, liturgy really is the prime medium of truth. Liturgy is more important than councils, dogmatic statements, etc. I see online that Roman Catholics have an obsession with certitude. Infallibility and validity are twin concepts. I think validity has a psychological force in the Roman Catholic Church that it does not have in orthodoxy. I think in place of valid and infallible, orthodoxy has axios and theoprepis, worthy for worship and appropriate for God, for doctrine. These were topics not only for online debate or ecumenical dialogue. Father Matthew saw their relevance for his parishioners, too. I served liturgy yesterday for St. Photius, he wrote. I tried to preach for the first time a celebrant, off the cuff. Could not come up with such good stuff. It's difficult in the morning, I said. Much easier to preach off the cuff in the evening. He went on. I just told the people about who Photius was, his learning, the controversies of his day. Then I spoke of the Good Shepherd in the Gospel reading and said that Photios is emblematic as a pillar of orthodoxy, that a Good Shepherd not only knows his sheep by name, but is also zealous for the truth and the integrity of the faith, i.e. filioque controversy. But I had wanted to say more about the ecumenical dialogue, that we have made some inroads on the issue, etc. I think it's important for priests to talk to their people about this in a balanced way, People either think that we are all the same, or that, or they have 
bad caricatures of Roman Catholic heresies, etc. Neither good. Here, Father Matthew returns again to the theme of inadequate education in the parish. What could be done for its improvement? What were the root causes of its defects? Such questions were never far from Father Matthew's thoughts. We have academics who are either entirely on the wrong side, he said, or really wishy-washy, and then we have clergy who are mostly sensible, well-intending, and in the right, but lacking in subtlety. He was intent on finding ways to improve the scene, and it became clear to him that first-rate seminary education was key. Hence his ambivalence towards academic work outside the seminary context. Given the choice, he wrote, between teaching in the non-seminary context versus parish work, I will go with parish work. What I have hoped for with academic teaching really is somewhat seminary specific. Some don't understand this. It's about the mentoring of a specific type of student, namely young men who want to be priests and more broadly, men or women who want to serve the church in a very specific capacity. He knew this was his vocation, and his colleagues knew it too, and would remind him of this when he needed encouragement. Matthew shared with me part of an email that Dr. George Hunsaker at Princeton Seminary sent to him during a particularly dark period. You need to think about your future as a mentor to the next generation, Hunsaker wrote. If you drop away, they will have few they can turn to. They will need you to give them hope. It will be for your son and his generation. Don't discount that. Those of us who knew Matthew Baker as a mentor and who introduced him to others and saw him begin to mentor them as well, bear the weight of a deep and abiding sorrow that new generations of young Orthodox intellectuals will not have the same privilege that we have had. It does seem at times that they will have few they can turn to. But something occurs to me that gives me hope. Father George Florovsky died before he had the chance in this life to meet his greatest and most dedicated disciple, Matthew Baker. And yet, Florovsky's voice was not buried with him in the grave. Neither, I am certain, was Baker's. Thursday in the first week of Lent. My phone lights up again. Tell me, why do you think first week salutations has a gospel reading? Well, actually, I replied, in Greek usage, Compline every night of clean week has a gospel reading. That I recall. Okay, I did not put that together, he replied. I went on. So, the Gospel for Salutations is probably part of a series unrelated to the Akathist. It's a Passion Gospel, isn't it? No, he said. It is, I am the true vine. Oh, interesting, I said. Yeah, he said, trying to think of something intelligent to say tomorrow. Somehow, I texted back. I suspect you will succeed. <laughs>